Francis is Irish born and had a number of years helicopter flying experience including a stint in the North Sea before venturing out to the tuna fields in the Pacific. His first day on the job saw him get a quick check out in a Bell 47 before being told to fly out and find his boat that had already steamed out of port. The rest of the job he learned as he went with some close calls along the way. Fishing is big business and a good net full of tuna can pay back weeks of helicopter hire cost in one go. A ship's helicopter is used to scout for signs of tuna schools over a much larger area than would be possible otherwise. They are used for herding the fish during the netting operation and for general hash and trash flights. Frequently the pilot may be the only English-speaking person on board the ship and the operations are remote from support and facilities. That small helideck on top of the bridge could well be the only dry landing spot within fuel endurance and to make things even more exciting it might have moved a considerable way since you last saw it at takeoff. There are lots of traps waiting for the unwary green pilot on their first trip out. For instance Francis spent a lot of time in the manual about tie-downs and as he puts it, trying to external load a tuna trawler with an MD500 and a rear right tie-down strap and the predictable results on the attitude of the helicopter. The crew on both boats were great guys who worked hard, and my own hours increased along with my experience. I went from flying 20 hours a month at the start, to up to 90 hours some months towards the end of my contract. Bob repairs a cracked chin bubble on the MD500 at the end of a long day's work. The helicopter is typically used to look for fish, although sometimes it's used to transfer parts between boats, as a medevac, or even just dropping the captain to a friend's boat for refreshments. Typically, I'd fly two to three times a day with a spotter, who is normally the second or third officer.
We were often searching for fish attracting devices, usually man-made rafts with several meters of netting underneath. These would serve as a safe haven for small fish, which would attract bigger fish, which in turn would attract tuna. I can have hundreds of tons of tuna with them, so are of high value to the boat. But they are also typically small and well camouflaged, so can be hard to spot, especially in rough weather. Suffice it to say, once you have spotted one, you don't want to lose sight of it. I made that mistake once, but soon learned to lock onto them. As the helicopter pilot, you are not required to look for fish, but if you learn to spot and estimate tonnage it's appreciated by the captain and your spotter, plus it gives you something to do besides calculate fuel burn, land, and time and distance to the boat. The helicopter was sometimes used to encourage the fish to stay in the net before it was closed. Ayan mga kagimbang, pang 35 metric tons na yung nasasalog natin at marami pang natitira sa pulido. At marami-rami itong nakulong ni Kisha sa kararang ngayon. Mga kagimbang, nakadali rin ang may pulyo. Matagal nang hindi nakatagpo ng ganito. Puro bariya-bariya yung natitira namin kaya medyo matagal at tayo dito sa fishing ground. Sen is a large net used to surround a shoal of pelagic fish. Once shot, the bottom of the net is drawn together by hauling in a long wire called the purse line to form a huge cup shape of netting just below the surface of the water with the targeting fish inside. The net is gradually hauled on board the vessel and the catch taken on board the vessel. A large open purse sen net deployed in a circle alongside vessel. A large vessel with a purse sen net deployed in a circle alongside them. Apart from the bycatch issue when fads are used, the purse sen can be considered as environmentally friendly. It is very species selective in that for the smaller pelagics, purse sen can usually only be used on a seasonal basis on particular areas when the particular target species is known to show up in that area. 
the skipper can also tell by shape and behavior of the shoal whether it is the target species or not. They can also aim to catch the size of fish they are looking for by picking a certain section of the shoal. Larger fish are often on the outside of the shoal. Very occasionally there may be some larger fish or cetaceans encircled in the net, but usually these can be released by dipping the float line and allowing them to swim out without too much loss of target species. If the catch is the wrong species or the wrong size the whole catch can be released unharmed before the net is hauled completely. A purse sen does not come into contact with the seabed, therefore minimal seabed impact. Very occasionally in shallow water the bottom of the net may lay on the seabed, but as the gear is not dragged across the seabed there should very little effect. As a purse sen is not towed through the water by the vessel, it has relatively low fuel consumption, limiting greenhouse gas emissions. A purse sen is shot in a circle around a shoal of fish, to form a deep curtain of netting hanging vertically in the water. The net is fitted with rings, purse rings, along its lower edge, through which a strong cable is passed. As this cable is hauled in it closes up the bottom of the space encircled by the purse sen, preventing the fish from escaping downwards. The net will now form a bowl-like shape in the water containing the fish. In both ring net and purse sen, the skipper will firstly locate and track a suitable shoal of the target species. Nowadays, this is done using a package of sophisticated electronics including sonars, echo sounders and GPS systems. However, this is still a very skillful part of the fishing operation, success depending very much on the skipper's ability and experience. Once the shoal is located, the vessel will drop one end of the net, with a darn on it, and shoot the net in a circle around the shoal of fish forming a curtain of netting around them. As the vessel completes the circle, they will pick up the darn and first end of the net. In some fisheries, a second smaller boat called a skiff is used to take the end of the net, instead of just using a darn, and tow it round to meet the main vessel and complete the circle. Once both ends of the net are back on board the purse sana, they will then start to close up the bottom of the net by hauling in the purse line to prevent the fish from escaping downwards. Once this is hauled in, the fish should be contained in a huge bowl shape of netting alongside the boat. The net is slowly hauled on board, gradually decreasing the size of the bowl containing the fish, until all the fish are alongside the boat in the strengthened section of the net called the bun. They will then start to take the fish on board the vessel. Originally, this was done using a braille that is similar to a large version of an angler's landing net to scoop the fish out and dump on deck. This method is still used for larger pelagic fish, but for small pelagics such as herring and mackerel, nowadays, it is normal practice for the larger, more modern, boats to use fish pumps to pump the fish on board. As the catch comes on board, it will pass through a water separator, the surplus water flows directly back overboard and the fish will be channeled into large tanks of refrigerated seawater, RSW tanks, for storage. Smaller boats may use a simpler system of chilled seawater, CSW tanks, that contains a mixture of seawater and ice to cool it down. Larger pelagic fish, such as tuna, tend to be stored below decks in a refrigerated or freezer hold. As the purse sen is hauled, it is passed from the side of the vessel to a pound, aft, where it is stowed ready to shoot again. The larger UK registered purse signers, 60 meters to 70 meters in length, will use very large nets that can be large enough to fill the back of an articulated lorry. These will be in the region of 700 meters long and 200 meters deep, that would encircle an area approximately 250